From the rolling fields of a Saxon age to a thriving complex of industrial and residential developments, a place of continual self-renewal and enduring entrepreneurship. This is a haven of multiculturalism. This is the heart of the city. This is Foes Hill, the People's Hill. In the centre of England, in the north of Coventry, lies Foes Hill. One of Coventry's oldest suburbs, it was first documented in Saxon times in the Doomsday Book. Falks Hill was described as a moot or meeting point, a hill or mound on which the community would congregate and discuss. To the present day, this social aspect remains key to the essence of Foes Hill. The General Wolf Inn, which was in those days a, a small cottage, used to uh, be surrounded by open farmland and apparently the farmers would sit outside, in, a row of farmers would sit outside the pub in the evening on the bench and uh, looking over the cornfields. And of course in those days you had nightingales were quite common and corn crakes, which are actually extremely rare in this country, they're a protected species. Uh, that was one of the most common birds, apparently, in Fergus, up to the 19th century. At the centre of the ancient village lay St Lawrence's Church, built in the 11th century. At the time, Coventry was part of the Anglo-Saxon Kingdom of Mercia. The region is now known as the English Midlands. The name Mercia has its roots in Latin and means border people. The Earl of Mercia in the 11th century was Leofric, his wife, Lady Godiva, the Countess of Mercia, is now one of Coventry's most notable figures. The church would have been at the centre of community life, surrounded at that time by large open fields and scattered hamlets. Foes Hill was to remain a green and pleasant land for some time to come. Well, historically, Foles Hill was a much, much bigger area than it is today, and it was outside Coventry. It included quite a lot of Bedworth, all of Longford, quite a lot of Bell Green. And the centre of Foles Hill was at St Lawrence's Church, which is now in Bell Green. And then gradually, um, Foles Hill got um, sort of divided up by the different, uh, different local government reorganisations. And I think it was in 1928 and 1932, there were local government reorganisations and Coventry expanded to take over initially Foles Hill and then Longford and uh, Bedworth was created as a separate district. So the Foles Hill we have today as a district of Coventry um, underplays its importance historically. Foes Hill remained a rural, agricultural, slow-paced community until the start of the Industrial Revolution in the late 18th century. During this time, the landscape of Britain changed forever. The socio-economic and cultural conditions of Foes Hill were no different and altered dramatically. Common land used for farming was now being enclosed and given to wealthy landowners. Farming was replaced by factories, Progress had arrived. The main industry, of course, from agriculture was weaving, and it started, it kicked off possibly late 17th, 18th century, and came through, and it became um, quite a big industry in the, in the Fosal area. I suppose the effect, you, there was a certain kick on effect because of Coventry building up as well, and more people came to live along the Fosal Road. My great great grand's family were weavers as well, they had a factories in uh, Fosal and um, they had cottages in, in a place now called Cross, Crossroads which is actually named after them. The origin of the name is from the Cross family who were my ancestors. Ribbon weaving began in earnest and was set to become one of Fosal's Hill's biggest exports. Brought over by French immigrants settling in the area, Foes Hill was home to some of the city's largest silk weaving factories. 
In 1768, the Coventry Canal was opened, enabling greater links to other parts of the country, plus the widespread transportation of coal. Railways were improved throughout the 19th century, and in 1838, the Coventry and Nuneaton Railway was opened. We're standing in Webster's Park now. This area was famous for, um, for its brickworks. Broad Street, which is slightly to the north, was once known as Brick Kiln Lane. And there's been brickworks in this area for over two, 200, 300 years. Um, and there used to be, where we're looking at the park, that used to be a hole in the ground. It was, a, it was sort of filled and now landscaped. Um, and if you look around carefully, you'll see places where the, the gases and that vent off from, uh, from the rubbish that was used to fill them. The Industrial Revolution brought with it entrepreneurship. Two such entrepreneurs and philanthropists were the Cash Brothers. They set up a mechanised ribbon factory in Foes Hill. The site still exists on Cash's Lane. The brothers were Quakers who believed in improved working conditions. Weavers and their families lived in the two-storey terraced houses. The top floor provided a well-lit workshop for the weavers. They were also on site, so production was much faster. Cashes still survives today, but in the Tile Hill area of the city. The original factory in Foes Hill has been redeveloped into housing association homes. The building still retains many of its original features and is true to its roots by still providing improved living conditions. Alongside Cash's Ribbon Factory, Foes Hill became home to a large part of Coventry's industrial heritage. Courtauls, Herberts and Rileys, all world famous in their day, had factories in Foes Hill. I was here as an apprentice fitter turner in the mid 60s, which meant I travelled around the uh, building, uh, the site, sorry, starting off in the apprentice training school, which was over the road, which is no longer there. It was a good, good place. I spent many happy years here, but uh, now when I look at the changes, you know, uh, as you can see behind, this is an office. This building was part of uh, main offices. Uh, I believe the boardroom, national boardroom for Courtauld's was here and then further to my left was an, a, a nice building which was the, the canteen or the dining room or the restaurant depending on what grade you were. So ours was just like an open canteen where you could get breakfast at 10 o'clock in the morning, bait and eggs. Uh, apprentices used to eat them and hope by the time they got the till nobody noticed. Behind the building which was the restaurant is was the garage. And you just get some you know chauffeur driven cars in there. There's a footbridge that would come across the road. And actually on the other side of the road is where I went, met the lady that became my wife. She wasn't working here but she was visiting somebody. So that was the, it was a it stretched like I say up to the lights on the Fosal Road and the junctions changed because the main road was the Fosal and then Lockers turned off and then all the way up to almost to King, well, to Kingfield Road. So it was a big, big site. I've no idea how many people worked here, but it was massive. Sadly, these industrial giants have long since declined, and like so much of British industry, exist only in the memories of the people who worked there. Courtauld's employed so many, and, and it was a sort of place people came and worked and retired from and they looked after you. Like I say, there was housing. Uh, we used to get a bonus scheme for holidays. I think it's a big loss. Well, in Coventry, all this production, I mean, what do we make? We made a lot of stuff here. It's a big chunk of Fosal. And like I say, people around here came, I think people moved to the area to be near the factories. But it's just a big chunk of that history gone. A big chunk of my life. You know. Not just famous for its industrial heritage, Foes Hill also has a famous literary heritage. Mary Ann Evans, better known by her pseudonym of George Eliot, lived at Birdgrove in Foes Hill. The ribbon weaving, which featured in her book Middlemarch, is widely believed to be based on her time in Coventry, and Foes Hill is described in the book under the pen name of Tipton. Birdgrove was named after, basically, because there were lots and lots of birds there, apparently. And so it was full of birdsong and stuff. So it was particularly attractive, and that's uh, 
that's where they chose to live and she looked after her father until he died and of course while, while she was there um, the pairs lived next door and they introduced her to the Brays Charles Bray and Caroline Bray uh, and um, then she, she through Charles Bray she started to write and produced the first writings in the Coventry Herald uh, then she translated um, uh, The Life of Christ by Strauss and then she actually started to, to actually write, she left Coventry just before she started writing novels. But, it was, but the whole idea, the whole thing about writing was really kicked off properly in Coventry. It broke her away from certain moulds she'd grew up and she'd been educated of course in Coventry as well and um, by the Franklin sisters and in her earlier days she was, she was very religious and, and she would have probably made a great vicar's wife basically. Yeah. But um, when she met the Brays, the, the, they were, the Brays were what you would call free thinkers. <laughs> phrenology, he used to do phrenology and fill bumps and stuff like that. I had the odd, odd uh, illegitimate child, which actually broke her from the mould of, she would have, like I say, literally, you could imagine him becoming a vicar's wife or something. But she bro that broke the mould meeting the Brays and made her think independently, which she did for the rest of her life. The war had a devastating effect on Coventry. Relentlessly bombed, it suffered a huge amount of damage. By the end of the war in 1945, very little of Coventry's original architecture was left still standing. With the city on its knees, extra hands were needed for rebuilding and cheap labour was sought. You can see basically where every bomb dropped, uh, it's left its mark even today. There's a, a public house across the road and Stony Stanton Road that's only a single storey because uh, in the war the top storey was, was bombed and they didn't rebuild it. So little bits of history wherever you're looking for. So. The 1960s saw a huge influx of South Asian, predominantly Indians, as well as many newcomers of African Caribbean origins. Many of these communities made Foes Hill their home. As I grew up, We've seen the Fosal area start to change, you know, um, other new communities started to arrive and you had the, uh, the Asian communities start to come to Fosal, which really was a bonus for the area because, um, you know, they brought with them their entrepreneurial skills and suddenly the Fosal Road came to life and you had, um, you know, all these new shops all like springing up with different sorts of products, different clothes and, um, and at very reasonable prices. So then as I grew up again and um, I remained in Coventry and started to have my children, the Fosal Road when the, the kids were young was a source of getting cheap socks and things like that. So, um, so that's, I mean, it's always been a sort of focal point for a lot of people in, in Coventry and the surrounding areas. Foes Hill is an area rich in culture. It is also the home of many recent arrivals from parts of the world which are suffering conflict. Due to its diversity, Foes Hill is now renowned in the city for its eclectic mix of cultures, played out in the different types of shops and eateries that run along the Foes Hill Road. I'm originally from Africa, so I like African food stuff. And there are so many corner shops around here which sell food which suit me. So I like fossil one because people are very nice, friendly, and um, I feel a sense of safety where I am. The rolling hills and ribbon weaving of the past have given way to sari shops and takeaway restaurants. But the roots of Foes Hill still lie in the community working and pulling together. I think Fosal has always been quite multicultural. We've been quite lucky. There's always been an influx of different communities coming to settle in Fosal Road. Even though, you know, there's a lot of people moving in, a lot of people moving out, but you've got that community spirit. If you go to the local shop, you've got that friendly face. Home to many refugees, asylum seekers and EU immigrants who have come into Coventry since 2001. Foes Hill has provided a refuge and a sanctuary. If you're an economic migrant, you tend to get work at the cheap end of the market. So for all of those reasons, Foles Hill is, is an area that they come to, as has always been, because Irish people came here and Asian people came here and of course have settled. 
The downside of this is that it is also statistically one of the most disadvantaged areas in Coventry, with well below the national average figures on employment, education and health. Vose Hill does have its problems. One of the most powerful things about Folsall is its diversity, but with the diversity of people, you bring the, the extra challenges. The sort of people who want to work here are the ones who are really sort of interested in working with a broader group of people. So we do, you know, in terms of health, statistically, um, Folsall's not too good, unemployment, um, education, all of those sort of generic sort of, you know, statistics, we just don't score too well on. I know personally, you know, I chose to come to Folsall. I actively picked Folsall. If, the, if there was no Folsall in the job description, I know I wouldn't have been here. So, and it has a certain lure for me um, because it's, it's, it is an exciting, creative place. Providers of private, public and voluntary services are working very hard to bring as much support into the area as possible. Some of the services that we've developed and set up and, and are now quite established are really sort of bearing that sort of fruit. We're getting actually people from the new communities, which are refugees and asylum seekers and EU citizens, to really contribute back to Folsall. So they've, had, they've been assisted and once they get to a certain point, they actually start pouring their energies and efforts and you know all their positive um, thoughts towards Fosal and helping other people and you've got that sort of positive chain reaction. Fosal does offer you a lot of opportunities and I think for women in particular you've got Saw Hill and you've got Fosal Women's Training um, of course the Fosal Children's Centre here which has opened up a lot more opportunities for the families within this area and one thing I've got to say in the years that of all the years that have gone by, the opportunities for women are greater now. The Rico Arena is a shining example of large-scale multi-agency investment in the Fosal area. Hosting international acts, the Rico has provided new jobs for the locals of Fos Hill and attracted business into the area. The Rico is such a wonderful arena. It's a wonderful venue, it's a wonderful destination. It's used 365 days a year, 24 hours a day, and uh, it's a great benefit for the, for the city of Coventry with all the facilities that it's got. Foes Hill has seen many transformations through the ages. By peeling back the hidden history, we can see how the area's rich heritage is far-reaching in the city. The colour and vibrancy it brings, the new cultures and old traditions, all housed in this relatively small part of the city. But one thing that always remains is that Fos Hill, however diverse, shares a commonality of spirit. It is a place of community, a place of the people. The People's Hill. The sense of community in Fosal is fabulous and it's the main asset. My hope would be for, for Fosal that the city recognises that it is a bit of a heart for, um, for newly arrived people and it makes, it makes it a welcoming place, it builds on its welcoming spirit. When I moved in I was uh, pleasantly surprised that people who didn't know me at all and did not have an idea that I was moving in the neighbourhood knocked at the door and told me when the bin is being collected and they told me that um, the, you know, the security issues of the area and they were basically looking, um, watching over each other and uh, I'm very, very pleased with uh, my experience over there. There's so much untapped potential here and there's so much sort of, you know, creativity and some of the things that people do and they tell me they do and I think I wouldn't be able to do it given those sort of obstacles. You've got a real sort of gutsy minority, um, uh, uh, community here and it's just really, it'd be great to see them sort of achieve some of their own personal goals. But I think it's nice if some of the existing um, communities here could be more welcoming to some of the new people and recognise their commonality because there are, there is a, there's an element of transience here. Some people won't be able to stay in the area, but some people will. And sometimes when people come to an area, they don't know what it's going to be for them. They don't know if they're going to have to move on quickly or whether they can stay here. I think Folsal does do a very good job of trying to 
trying to cope with that because it's not an easy thing for a neighbourhood. I'd love for Fosal to have the next great scientist and next great sort of, you know, I, I like Fosal to get sort of be world renowned for something, you know, and I, and I know it's only a matter of time because the people are so very special. <laughs> okay. I intend to stay for a while. <laughs>